the book of Hosea, chapter 9, with a word of wisdom from our Father in Jesus' name, verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy, as other people, for thou hast gone a-whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, symbolic of bondage, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. When they historically went into captivity, and the Assyrian is a type of Antichrist. There is a captivity in the end times as well, a captivity to Satan's one world system, once he appears as the false Christ in Jerusalem at the sixth trumpet. And that's when the virgin bride of Christ goes from being a virgin to a whore, the whore of Babylon. Babylon meaning confusion. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him. Their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, and their bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. They'll be taking communion to Satan, thinking that he's Jesus. They'll cease to take communion to the true Christ at the sixth trumpet. Pretty sick. And had they only studied their father's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse with understanding, they could have avoided the embarrassment that will happen to them at the seventh trumpet. What will ye do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at the wedding table and you yourselves thrust out into outer darkness, as Christ said. And I'm paraphrasing there, but what he's saying there is, what are you going to do when you're shut out of the kingdom at the seventh trumpet? So listen, in other words. Understand that there is a false one coming. Satan is Antichrist. He comes before the true Christ returns, and you're not going to be raptured out of here. That's not biblical at all. I dare you to show me where it says that. It doesn't say that in here. Who told you that? Nobody read the Bible from cover to cover, closed the book, and said, well, that settles it. We're going to fly out of here. Never said that in there at all. Go check it out. You won't find it. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Bondage, captivity, Memphis, part of Egypt, shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. Thorns, symbolic of the Kenites. Remember the thorns and thistles written of in Genesis chapter 3, right after Cain was conceived, okay? The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. It's reckoning time. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God. The one that really watched events transpire was aware of God's word, had the seal of God in his forehead, and watched current events. And as we do today, we watch the one world system being formulated. You're a watchman. You're supposed to watch. It's orders from Christ himself. What I say unto you, I say unto all. He's talking to you there. All means everybody. Watch. He said in the last verse of Mark chapter 13. So the watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet, the false prophet, is a snare of a fowler in all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. And ultimately, this looks forward to Satan's role of Antichrist, called the false prophet in the book of Revelation, destroyed along with Satan's one world system in the lake of fire upon the return of the true Christ. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Remember Judges chapter 19, whenever they abused the concubine all night long to the point where she died. And then she was cut into 12 pieces and mailed to the coasts of Israel, started a civil war, and Benjamin was all but destroyed, almost. He just barely, by the skin of his teeth, survived that. All because of perversion and condoning perversion, okay? Therefore, he will remember their iniquity. He will visit their sins. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time, the good figs, as opposed to the evil figs, which are the Kenites. 
the good figs being the children of the kingdom. It's the equivalent of the parable of the tares in the field, the wheat being the children of the kingdom and the tares being the children of the wicked one. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. And this is in Numbers chapter 25. Due to the counsel of Balaam, Israel sinned again, committing idolatry there with the Moabite women, as you can read of in Numbers chapter 25. Balaam had just had this wonderful prophecy come through him, which was from God. But the moral of the story is, just because that happened didn't mean that he was good from then on out, because right after that, he backslid to his soothsaying occupation that he had before that, and caused Israel to sin, and he was killed for that reason. If you go on to read the rest of Numbers, you'll find that out for yourself. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. They want to fly away? Well, their glory is going to fly away. They'll be made naked in that day upon the return of the true Christ. From the birth and from the womb and from the conception, though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. That's when the trouble starts. When God departs from you, he'll never leave nor forsake you unless you leave him, unless you commit crimes against him and refuse to study his word. Then he'll leave you because it's you that left him. So he'll never leave you nor forsake you, but you can leave him. All right? You see my point here? See what I'm saying? He doesn't do the leaving. You do. You've got to do it God's way. And how do you know what God's way is? Again, Read the Bible, study it, understand it. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, that's one of Satan's names, it means rock, the king of Tyrus and the prince of Tyrus, he's called in Ezekiel 28, is the false rock, not our rock, which is the true Christ. Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Who's the murderer? Who was a murderer from the beginning, as we know from John chapter 8? Satan. He shall bring his children to the murderer. Teaching their children the traditions of men leads them right into the arms of the murderer, Satan, the spiritual murderer, who kills a third spiritually at the sixth trumpet. And teaching people that Christ will return at any moment is one way to bring forth your children to the murderer. If you teach your children that, you're killing them spiritually because you're setting them up to worship Satan. And that's how you lose credit for all your righteous acts as well as your eternal salvation. And you can get your act together during the millennium if it was done in ignorance. It is reparable, but you'd have to go through that whole thousand year period with a liable to die mortal soul. Wouldn't you much rather take part in the first resurrection than bear that shame for a thousand years? I think anybody would rather go ahead and take part in the first resurrection and have Christ say, well done, good and faithful servant, rather than him saying, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's up to you. I mean, if you want to pray for the mountains to fall on you, if that sounds like fun to you, then go right ahead. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. And as Christ said, Woe unto them that are with child and give suck in those days. He's not talking about being physically pregnant. He's talking about those who are impregnated in their mind with the mark of the beast and have become a whore as opposed to a virgin. A virgin wouldn't be with child and giving suck. So having a miscarrying womb and dry breasts wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing from a certain point of view. But what God's saying here to Ephraim specifically, those who were disobedient, he is inflicting the curse. He's reinforcing what was written in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You can go read that and see what's written here and how it parallels each other. It's not good. Wouldn't it be much easier to simply understand God's word? It's up to you. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. Why did he hate them? That's when they said, give us a king to reign over us. We don't want God to reign over us anymore. We want a human king that we can see. 
And because of them doing this, now you have Jeroboam causing them to worship these golden calves, setting them up and commanding that they worship them. But it's the people's fault for following that commandment. Obviously, that was not the thing to do, and now they're going into captivity. But it all goes back to them demanding a king that they could see. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away, because they did not hearken unto him. Why? Because they did not hearken unto him. So it's real easy to prevent this from happening to you on an individual level. Hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, as it's written in Deuteronomy 28. That's the key to receiving God's blessings. But if you ignore that, you're going to, by default, have the curses poured upon you. You don't want that. And they get increasingly worse on a national as well as an individual level. So check it out. Deuteronomy 28 It's a good place to start if you're not familiar with our Father's Word. My God will cast them away. They're going into captivity because they did not hearken unto him and they shall be wanderers among the nations. And so it was. They went north over the Caucasus Mountains. They settled in Europe and Eventually, the United States was formed by these same people, the so-called lost tribes of Israel. But they're not lost to God. God knows where every single one of them is. And they form the Christian nations. So again, Abraham's seed, singular, not plural, was Christ Jesus. It is Christ Jesus. And so the Christian nations bring forth Christ to the nations. And if you be Christ, regardless of race, color, or creed, Ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, as it's written in Galatians chapter 3. So there you have it, the book of Hosea chapter 9.